Great to have you all here. I'm uh, David Rancher. I'm the Chief Technological Officer at Family Search. It's uh, delightful to be here, delightful to be in Philadelphia, and uh, great to spend some time with you. Um, they asked me if I would uh, come and talk about Family Search, uh, something you will find I'm a little passionate about. Um, I've worked at uh, Family Search for a number of years. In fact, uh, the other day they sent an internal department survey around. And uh, the first question was, How long have you worked at Family Search? So I typed in my answer, pushed next, and then the delightful little screen came back and said, Please recheck the validity of your answer. It's outside the range of available <laughs> years. So I've been, yeah, <clears throat> the 20-somethings that put the survey together couldn't imagine that someone would actually work at an organization for 35 years. And so uh, my answer was rejected, and I, I felt rejected, but it's okay. <laughs> what are they trying to tell me, huh? Well, today I want to just spend some time uh, helping you understand a little bit about the scope of Family Search. Family Search has been around a long time, uh, not as long as the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, but we, we have been doing uh, a lot of good things for a lot of years. And then as we moved into the internet space, obviously uh, that gives us some differences and some different advantages to some of the other uh, partners that we have out there. And so we work very cooperatively with them uh, they look at us as competition, we look at them as coopetition. So it's just a little bit different view. Um, one of the things I like to say is it's all about the experience. And uh, this is a graveyard in uh, Northern Ireland that I visited. And you know, when you pull up and you take one look at it, you kind of go, okay, this is, we're going to be here a while. You know, it's just one of those things that you, that you look at. Uh, every Friday night, I like to take my wife out to dinner and, uh, you know, there are only so many things you can do to a piece of chicken. And so, as we choose a restaurant on a Friday night, it really is all about the experience. Uh, do we like the servers? Uh, can we sit someplace in the restaurant where the cold air isn't blowing on my wife? Uh, is parking convenient? Easy access? All those kinds of things. And so it's the whole experience when you go out and you choose something. Well, that's very similar as we choose websites and experiences on websites, as many of us have uh, much of the similar data. You like the experience of this particular website versus this particular website. So I like to just share with you some of the features and the things that are here. Um, we are the largest genealogical organization in the world. Uh, we have been uh, spreading information around the globe for many, many years. We were founded in 1894 as the Genealogical Society of Utah. We're a nonprofit organization uh, predominantly driven by volunteers. Uh, and it's sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So when you think of Family Search, uh, we have nearly a thousand uh, employees uh, spread across the globe, in uh, and, and with capabilities in a number and a variety of areas, in particular history and languages, uh, archival science, computer technology. Uh, we're very strong in the micrographics department. For years, we had a very strong working relationship with the folks at Kodak. We drove uh, the microfilm technology and the quality of that uh, microfilm. Some of you have probably looked at poor quality microfilm, and you've looked at good quality microfilm, and I'm talking to an audience that very much knows the difference. Um, if you look just a little bit at our history, uh, this is our, our very humble beginning. You'll notice up there in the uh, left-hand corner a little room. Uh, when we started out as the Genealogical Society of Utah, there were about six people, and they predominantly helped people answer correspondence. Um, many of the people who had moved to Utah had come from the eastern United States and from uh, Europe. And so what had happened was they were separated from their records, the records that they needed to research their ancestry. And so the staff there would actually help them write letters and, and conduct correspondence to try and find the data that they wanted. In 1922, we began an indexing initiative. And you will notice, uh, and I know that I'm in a crowd that actually recognizes these little file drawers and what these file cabinets are. <laughs> Sometimes I have to explain that to a, to a younger crowd. But this was an indexing initiative to be able to compile information on uh, various ancestors and people's ancestry. Um, in 1938, we began microfilming. You'll notice that uh, the, the film hanging above a bathtub, that really is a bathtub there in that lower picture. 
Our uh, camera operators would actually develop their own film uh, in the evening times. They would shoot images all day long, and then they would develop the film. Because if they had to do retakes, they had to go back into the archive the next day, and if they had something that they had not uh, been able to take a clear shot on, they would take another shot of that uh, image. By 1963, we had so much microfilm that we built um, the Grand Mountain Record Vault there in Low Cottonwood Canyon in Salt Lake City. We wanted a long-term preservation uh, method. Now, of course, that is also extending to our digital collection, and we have many uh, millions of digital images stored there as well. Uh, many of you were around and, uh, as we transitioned from the old uh, Family History Library to the new one in 1985. Uh, I was actually working there then. In 1998, we took all of our microfilm cameras to the field and shifted those to digital cameras. And so we currently have 300 operating digital cameras. So as we're gathered here today, we have uh, camera operators around the globe clicking images as I speak uh, of additional materials. In 1999, we launched FamilySearch.org. We were a little behind uh, some of the other uh, people in the industry, but we had this wealth of information that we could then begin to put up. So think of this as two streams of enormous amounts of data. We had 2.4 million rolls of microfilm in the vault that were going on to machines that would convert that film to digital image and post that online. And then we had 300 cameras in the field that were clicking images and that data was going online. So just think of it as two huge fire hoses of data coming at you. Uh, if you don't Believe that analogy, let me put it in terms you can understand. Each and every day we post 1.5 million names on our site. If you did not find your people today, check tomorrow. Okay? <laughs> That's all I can tell you. There's a lot of data coming at you. Well, how is that possible? Uh, we have a workforce of 400,000 volunteers that index much of that data. And they are indexing it on a number of different uh, data sets. So we have been working uh, with the uh, Italian government. We have been imaging 500 million images of Italian records. Uh, we are we are desperate for Italian indexers, uh, people that can read Italian and index those records. We launched a, an indexing project on the Freedmen Bureau records, and we have been posting those online. Uh, we have just all types of projects that uh, you can probably find one that you're interested in, and we can do there. Well, this experience began to evolve. By 2014, we launched a mobile app so that you could do a number of things on your phone. Um, uh, I'll go into more detail about the mobile app here in, in a couple of minutes, but there are so many things that you can do in one format or another. There are other ways that you can invite your family to experience. So, uh, if you say to your grandkids, come sit down with me, I want to show you our family history, doesn't always go real well, okay? <laughs> but if you're sitting at home and you find a really cool image or a census image or something, uh, something that tells a really cool story about your family, and you go into Family Search and you click share this on Facebook, now suddenly you can get your grandkids to open it on Facebook and you can tell them a little bit about what's going on. And they don't know it, but they're doing family history uh, because they're interested. So. Think about over 7.4 million views per day, uh, 4.7 million users and growing. Uh, we have over uh, 2,000 record collections, so individual collections. Think of, think of the U.S. 1940 census, for example, as a collection. We have over 2,075 of those. Uh, there are over 5.35 billion searchable names on our site, and those are free. So I know other sites have more information, but these are free searchable names in our site. Um, I know that many of us came out of a catalog environment, uh, and that that's an experience that we uh, sometimes are more familiar with, or we have learned to become familiar with. Um, I just want to tell you about an experience I had here in Pennsylvania. I was out at the Lancaster Historical Society, uh, first visit, I walked in, greeted by the staff, extremely friendly, knowledgeable, helpful. Uh, is this your first visit here? Uh, why, yes it is. Would you like a quick tour? I would love one. Uh, here's our card catalog. Uh, look through there, find the locality and the record type that you want to look at. Fill out this little uh, slip of paper, hand it to the staff, they'll bring you the records. Great, totally get it. 
Uh, here's our map case if you need maps. Um, here are some of the other features of our facility. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm in heaven. Okay? I am right where I want to be uh, on the day I want to be there. So I sit down and I begin doing my research and I'm having plenty of success because I'm familiar with that format. Uh, but I can hear some other people around me who aren't having as good a day as I'm having. They, they are struggling with that methodology. They are struggling finding the right records, finding the right uh, sources to use. Well, uh, it was just kind of that, remember when I said it's all about the experience? That was the experience. The next day I went across the uh, Susquehanna River over into York County. I walked in. Is this your first time here? Why, well, yes it is. What names are you working on? That's an interesting question. Well, I'm working on Oberlander and Dysinger. And, and uh, they said, have a seat here. We'll bring out to you what we have. Okay, that's an interesting experience. And pretty soon they brought me a file and they said, well, our volunteers have gone through and they've extracted all the instances of the surname Overlander, and here's everything we have in our records up to 1850. Here's a card file of all the cemetery transcriptions that we have for the Overlander uh, surname. And then they handed me a file and they said each day our volunteers go through and they clip all of the obituaries, and here are all the instances of the surname Overlander in the uh, file. On the bookcase there, you'll see that our published family histories are filed alphabetically from A to Z. If there's a published family history of the Overlander family, you'll find it on the shelf. This is a different experience. So the, the difference between the two experiences is one that was name, a, a name approach. Staff still spending an enormous amount of time behind the scenes doing a great job in both facilities. One was name approach, one was locality and record type approach. Do you see the difference? Well, we have a catalog that is record type and locality approach. So I went back to Utah and I said, guess what guys? <laughs> We need a name approach to our catalog. So we're still working on that because there are billions of names in that catalog. But it's a very different experience when you have that. So you can go into our catalog and you can search the records, you can search on genealogies. We're going to go through a few of these today so that you have an idea of all of those different features. But let me just start with the catalog because it is our access point and many of you, I fear, are not taking full advantage of the catalog. This is the breakdown of how users that come into our catalog use it. They use it first and foremost by place search, and then by last name. But look at the percentages for keyword, and for title, and for subject, and for call number. You can see that that rapidly drops off. So, when we look at this, if you go in and you type in a specific place, you will get um, something that describes what you want, and that will um, bring that back. So you can see that keywords can be from titles, places, authors, notes, series, and subjects. Let's say that you are doing research in Tacoma, Washington, and you want to research the newspapers in that area. If you go in and you type in Tacoma News, you will see that it comes back with a number of items from the News Tribune in Tacoma, uh, obituaries, death records, uh, a number of different things. And it keys in on News and Tacoma. Okay? Those two items triggered this result set. However, if you go into uh, and search uh, the same search, Tacoma News, in the subject search, produces no matching entries. So can you see the difference in uh, going into the subject catalog and going into the keyword catalog? So if you want to search our catalog and find items that pertain to the search you want, try the keyword search. As so we go back here, you will see that keyword is only used 8.2% of the time. So. When you're trying that, give it a try and try keyword in our catalog and see if you get a different result from what you've been getting before. Because if you keep trying the same results with the same search with the same results, you're not going to get what you need. Your, uh, your uh, ability
ability to search any of those different things are all there. You can type in, for example, Australia, Australian Capital Territory as a place, and it will bring back the results there. You'll notice off over to the right, we have OCLC WorldCat and Archive Grid. We formed a partnership with OCLC and added their data. We added their, our data to their system, and users now get the advantage of being able to use that data as well. So this, for example, will return monumental inscriptions from the Australian Capital Territory and bring you back the results that you want. Notice this piece down at the bottom now. View this catalog record in WorldCAD for other possible copy locations. So let's say that you don't have access to so get to our facility uh, quickly. You can check now to see where else those records may be located. And that will bring back for you other areas where that record is uh, located. So in this instance, uh, doing that, obviously there is a copy of the Family History Library, but there's also one in the Auckland Libraries, uh, one in the Sunshine Coast region, uh, uh, Richmond Tweed Regional Libraries. You can see now that there are various copies of that uh, from around the globe. Archive Grid is one that goes into many of the manuscript libraries throughout the uh, country. Um, I had found some of this data previously, but I can find it very easily now in Archives Grid. So for my family, um, a family down in North Carolina, there is a huge set of family letters deposited in the Manuscript Library at the University of Chapel Hill. And there's another set of family letters deposited in Duke University Manuscript Library. Both of those are contained in Archive Grid. Much of what I know about that particular branch of the family comes from those letters. It's correspondence between a brother and a sister, a brother in Alabama and a sister in North Carolina, and they are corresponding back and forth, talking about the births, marriages, and deaths of children, and what's going on, and the brother complaining that he's burned his cotton, but his neighbors won't burn theirs. It's during the Civil War, and all of, this, all of these events going on uh, during that time period. Well, Archive Grid is the way to find many of those family letters that may be deposited there. Interestingly enough, there are family uh, letters deposited here uh, that I also found on Archive Grid uh, because Abraham Rancher had corresponded with President James Buchanan and his papers are here. And so I was able to get those uh, letters as well. You can go in and you can see that uh, Archive Grid is um, contributors by country, you can see that the U.S. is the heaviest contributor, but you can also see, scattered across the globe, that other archives are participating in Archive Grid, and it is growing. So they are continuing to add data to that. Well, that partnership gives us worldwide access to the Family History Library catalog through WorldCat and Archive Grid. Some of you have come out of the library industry, and you are very familiar with um, WorldCat and Archive Grid, and so it's one of those uh, sources that's available to you on FamilySearch. It gives you the locations for every family history center around the world. Uh, you have the ability to identify all of the major genealogical holdings near your home. So that's one of the objectives, isn't it, is that you have ready access to that and you can identify those. The other thing that it now illuminates is the identification of previously unknown havens of historical records that you may want to search in your research. Well, uh, let's talk about the partners for a moment. Um, if we put this into perspective, um, if we just try to take this on ourselves, at the current rate it will take 200 to 300 years or about 11 generations to index online the records that we hold in the Granite Mountain Record Vault. Remember the 2.4 million rolls of film I told you about? Even with 400,000 indexers, it's going to take us uh, several generations. If we collaborate, it reduces the time to index those records to about one generation, or about 20 to 30 years. So we are working uh, very dramatically with our partners to try and share data and share information and to index those records. Um, we are also interested in uh, a, a global uh, information asset. So for example, we are in a partnership with uh, Ancestry.com to index the records for Mexico. We imaged them in the 1960s, we've had them on film, we have not uh, been able to index those, but we can work with a partner and get those indexed. So now a number of people who are of uh, Hispanic descent, who need to research the records of Mexico, are going to have a viable uh, 
tool that they can use as well. Uh, we've indexed records from the Philippines. We're indexing records in uh, South America, Central America, uh, obviously Europe, uh, and elsewhere around the globe. Well, um, when we work with partners, we make our records available in more places, and we accelerate the rate at which they are indexed, and then we are able to use those joint acquisition projects. When we index records, we have always done a, what's called a double-blind entry. So let's say that you key uh, the records first, you are A here. You key our records second, you are the B here. You do that independent of each other, you're not working in collaboration. An arbitrator looks at what you key and what you key and um, rectifies any differences in the two keys. That way we get into the high 90 percentile of accuracy for the records that we index. Think now about working with a partner. There's no difference in taking the partner's index and using that as the A key. So we don't have to send that out and have our indexers index that one. And then we do have our indexers do the B key and we do the exact same process. We arbitrate the differences. So let's say that a, that, um, a database that we're using has been uh, indexed or keyed offshore uh, by um, non-English speaking individuals, that, that, that index is still keyed against people who may know those records and the differences are arbitrated. Or vice versa, it may be that this one was done by English speakers, it's an Italian record and we now have Italian indexers keyed looking at that. You see how the quality just goes up for everybody involved? Well, those are the kinds of partnerships that we're able to do with our friends. So, for example, Ancestry.com, I think this actually now is uh, just gone over 15 billion records, uh, 6 billion persons in 60 million trees. So the difference between their tree and our tree is that they have a number of private trees. Okay? They don't have a central tree. We're going to talk about our tree here in just a moment. Uh, they have advanced search capabilities, and uh, they have a hinting mechanism called Shaky Leaves. Uh, I think you may have seen a television commercial or two on that. Um, so think also about the fact that behind each of these different companies, they have built their search engine, and that search engine is working from a set of standards for a particular name. So for example, there are a number of different ways to spell my name. I have a preferred spelling, but obviously I see it a number of different ways. Well, each of the different systems take those varieties, or those variants in spelling, and they put those in a name group. And so when I type in Wrencher into Family Search, and I get the results back for that, what it does is it goes out to the name authority and says, we're going to return all of the variants that we've identified that could be spelled for that name. So Wrencher with a W, Wrencher with an A, uh, Renshaw, all of those things end up in that name variant and they return that. Independently, Ancestry's done the same thing. They've gone out and they've created their name authority. So their variants may be different than the variants that FamilySearch has. In fact, I can tell you they are. Um, by my past, my heritage, any of these sites, what's going on behind the scenes is that they have different standard names that they are using to return the results set. That explains sometimes why you, even though it's the same data, you may find uh, the result returned in one uh, website and you don't find it returned in another. That's why I always like to check multiple websites because there are different search engines going on behind that data when you do that. Um, Finally, past is particularly rich uh, in the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Australia. I think uh, you're probably all aware that they just launched the uh, Irish Catholic records online. I never thought I would live long enough uh, to see that glorious day, but it has happened. Uh, they are particularly strong on England and Wales um, census records, uh, 1841 to 1911. And of course, they have all of the U.S. census data set as well. Uh, my heritage just kind of come strumming onto the scene. They have uh, smart matching. Uh, they are building up private family tree sites as well. Uh, they have 1.3 billion persons in trees. Uh, they are exceptionally strong in languages, as it is family search. Uh, they are actually doing some fun things with facial recognition and uh, historical photographs. Uh, they also have a mobile app. 
So you can see that each of us in the community have brought different resources to the table, and it really is fun. So Family Search works with these. We try to collaborate, and honestly, we've taken an approach that you you really don't care where the data is. You just want to get to it, right? Okay, it doesn't matter where it is. And so what we've tried to say is, it doesn't matter which website has the data. If we can connect you with the piece of information that you want, then that's what we're trying to do. And that's why you'll sometimes see something comes up that says, visit a partner site, because we have identified that the data you may want is at the partner site, not at ours. And we're perfectly happy with that. We honestly think you'll come back, because free is a pretty compelling offering. <laughs> Um, if you just look at the different record sets uh, across the globe, for example, uh, MyHeritage has uh, some incredible Australian um, data. Um, I will talk a little bit more about this in my next presentation, which is Descendant Research. Uh, but Pozilla is an app. We work with different companies. So when you think about what FamilySearch did with its family tree, we created Family Tree as a basis to be able to suspend other applications off of that. So if we think about family tree as just the crown jewel in the whole operation, then the developers can say, what can I do with that family tree data? And so they, we certify them to work with us. Pozilla was one of those. Pozilla was actually developed by a former employee who had left, but he knew that if he could take that data he could create a descendant research tool that would be phenomenal because of the structure that was in the tree. Think about uh, somebody deciding that they want to do a cemetery app and uh, they want to put it on the device on your car or on your phone. And so now you say, I'm going to take a trip to fill in the blank. Uh, the tree knows your pedigree. As you're driving down the road, it says, your great-great-grandfather is buried 2.7 miles off the next exit. Would you like to stop? Those are the kinds of things that you can enable when you are working from a central tree. You can begin to create apps that are fun and exciting and, and inviting. So now think about having a car full of children, and they're saying, if it comes on one more time. <laughs> Billion Graves has created a mobile app. You can go out and you can actually GPS the grave to it. We've worked with them. Um, they are strong on photographs, which is what I like. Um, because if it's in Billion Graves, then there actually is uh, a photograph of the stone. And uh, now they are starting to hint back. So you can now, if you find it in there, and they've identified that it's in Family Tree, you can actually now attach that stone to the record in Family Tree and have that as an authoritative source of information. Um, how many of you use the research wiki just for fun? Okay, great, because I'm going to teach a lot of you about it. Over the years, for many, many years, Family Search used to produce paper publications. Uh, we had a number of research guides. Honestly, before the ink was dry, they were out of date. When the internet came along, it was even worse because websites, links would, would change, they would break. There was constantly this new flow of data going on, and we had staff behind the scenes trying to update these paper publications. Honestly, it was, it was a train wreck. And we said, can we go to an online wiki model? So think Wikipedia for genealogists. That's what it is. So now think about the fact that, let's say that you are in one of our family history centers, and you open the doors, and the first question that comes through the door today is Kentucky research. Well, maybe Kentucky isn't your specialty. What, how are you going to answer that patient's question? The next question through the door is Denmark. The next one is Germany. The next one is New York. The next one is Florida. How can you be expected to know all of that information? Short answer, you can't. But knowledge experts who know the answers to information there can put that into the research wiki. Now, each of you know something. You have all done research in a particular area, and you have up here what I need in the wiki. If I could just capture the collective knowledge of what 
this room knows about research, I would have a phenomenal asset. So the example I like to give is uh, a number of years ago, I was doing research in Hill County, Texas. I'd gone over to the courthouse, and I'd had, honestly, a miserable morning. Uh, I didn't find a thing. Could not find the people. Everything in my information said I should be finding these people in Hill County, in the Hill County Courthouse. Here I am, the Chief Genealogical Officer at Family Search, and I can't find Spit. <laughs> So I had a good friend that I had made at a genealogical conference, uh, Nancy Franklin, who was the librarian in Mount Calm in Hill County, and that's where I was doing some research, and, my, and on my list to do was to go see Nancy, and so just after lunch I went over and I met up with Nancy at the little Mount Calm library there. Now Mount Calm is a great big, they have a stop sign. <laughs> if you blink, you'll miss them, I guarantee you will miss them. But they have a very nice little library, thanks to Nancy. Uh, who is a genealogist, and uh, I just lamented to Nancy, I says, Nancy, I've, I've been looking for these people all day and haven't found a thing. She picks up the paper, she looks at it, and she just smiles. She says, um, David, you know, when the railroad came through in 1881, they picked the entire town up, put it on skids, and they moved it one mile north so that it would be next to the railroad. When they did that, they moved Mount Calm out of Limestone County and into Hill County. And the records you want are all over in Limestone County. Seems like a simple thing, you know? But what she knew made all the difference. So I spent my afternoon in Limestone County, and guess what? I found everything I was looking for. Now, each of you have done research somewhere. You know things like that. There are, you, you, you've dug down, you've done the research. In some ways, you are the expert. You ever gone to a, a town and, and people are asking you for directions and you actually know where to send people because you've studied the map for so long? Well, the Family Search Research Wiki does that. So go into the search tab and go down the wiki and you can type in um, basically any topic, any subject you want. So in the wiki, Let's say that you want to type in Virginia, uh, because you want records on Virginia. You can type, you can search by subject, or you can search by locality. You can search where the ancestors lived in Virginia. Uh, you, can, you can search so many different ways. You can type in Richmond, Virginia, cemeteries, for example, and it will take you to an article. So now think about all of the rich information that we have gathered over the years. We can put that in there as a resource. It does two things. It serves you individually, but think about it now. We have 4,700 family history centers scattered throughout the globe. Think about what it does for our staff in those libraries. Think about what it does for public librarians who are serving genealogists and their ability to go in now and try to answer a question. So it's both a resource that you can pull from and it's a resource that you can contribute to. And so I just um, like to tout the wiki. It's one of the features of Family Search that sometimes is not well known or well understood. You can see here a, a number of different topics, and then you can get information about them uh, there. Now, some of you may think that if you have searched Family Tree, you have searched all of our lineage linked genealogies. I would like to say that's true. Uh, it's false. So. Let me help you understand our genealogy collection. Genealogies are trees of information that people have submitted to us. I like to consider them the cream. They're the conclusion data. They're right at the top of the pyramid. They're not raw data. Somebody's gone through, they've analyzed them, or something they knew, they put that data together, and they said, it's my opinion that this person had these parents, this person was born in this place on this date, and these are their siblings. At some point, somebody's gone through that effort to try and compile those. So, our genealogies consist of a number of different things. One was Ancestral File. How many of you used Ancestral File years ago? It was on compact disks. You, you got pretty good at disk swapping, right? Um, 40 million ancestors on Ancestral File. Pedigree Resource File continues to take in 1 million names per month. People are still contributing to Pedigree Resource File in which they take the information on their desktop computer into an each form, and they upload it 
into the pen free resource file. Now they like pen free resource file because no one can change that data. It's the way they submitted it, their name's attached to it, and they have it. Uh, the International Genealogical Index had 430 million people in there in what we call mini trees, so uh, child parent relationships. And then we had a, a system called community trees, which were sourced submissions. So when I was the director of the Records and Information Division, I wanted to conduct an, a prototype with community trees. So we reached out to some genealogical and historical societies and other groups around the world, and we began to basically do what's called family reconstitution. We would reconstitute the families in that area. So we would take entire counties in the United States and we would reconstruct as much as we could all of the people in those communities. In Norway, for example, they were using the Vecta books where they were the farm books. So the farm books in Norway actually say when a family leaves that farm and which farm they go to. When they arrive in the other farm, it says here's where they came from. And so there's this, this wonderful linkage in those. And so county by county, we were working through those. If, for example, you look at community trees, this is a the variety of a number of counties and other areas where we have done family recon, reconstitution in that area. We're still open to family reconstitution projects. So if your genealogical society or group wants to get together and reconstruct uh, the individuals in that geographic area, we're still very open to those types of projects. We are currently moving that data over into family tree. But know that this data, as it goes in, is all well-sourced, well-documented, and the conclusions are there uh, in that form. So for example, if you want to search uh, Lewis County, Washington, you can search that database, and it will bring up for you the ancestors uh, in there, and you can see the different uh, result sets between pedigree resource file and the community tree, and you get those lineage links, which look very similar to family tree. So let's talk for a moment about family tree. Family tree was conceived to be a community effort. And that means that any of us can go in and we can add the data. So philosophically what it meant was over time it should get better and better. Now, we're struggling to get there because people can come in and they can change the data or make mistakes. You have to go back and you have to undo it um, uh, occasionally. Um, it isn't perfect. Uh, think of it as Windows 1.0. Uh, we're currently on Windows 10, okay? Think of the fact that we continue to add features. We, um, we continue to implement impedance models into it so that before people make a change, we want them to think about that. You know, we're, we'll probably start telling you, if you push a click here, you're going to affect the, the pedigree of 235 individual users in family search. Are you sure you want to do this? You know, think real hard about, about making that change. So there are different things that we can do to try and improve the quality there, but it does give you the ability to discover information on your ancestors and submitted by others who are in the family tree. It's also a place where you can search to see if anyone has done that. So kind of that survey phase of any genealogical research problem that we pick up. What do we want to know? We want to know if anybody else has researched this line and can we then build on what they've already done and save us the time of doing it. Uh, information on living individuals in the tree is protected. So while you can see your living information as a registered user of FamilySearch, no one else can see living information about you or any of the family members that you have placed in there. If there's no death date, then that data is blocked from, I can't view it, uh, even, even with my position in FamilySearch, I cannot go in and view that data. Um, you can view living information on yourself and your immediate family, uh, others cannot. I just want to make that perfectly clear that you have uh, that uh, ability. Um, one of the things that we added recently were hints on the traditional views, so we can tell you that we think that we have found a record. Remember all these 2,075 record collections that we have online? Well, we take the tree and we match it against those record collections, and then we put a hint tag over here that says, we think this individual over here in this record belongs to the person in your tree, and then we send you over there to look at it. You now decide. We don't automatically link it to that. You're going to decide whether or not those are the same individual and whether or not that should be linked. So when you look at that, you can see that that 
link icon will come up, that record hint icon will come up, and so in this instance, we think that we have found a Utah death certificate, for example, for that individual that should be linked to the tree. Now, if you want people to not change the data in the tree, I can tell you that statistically from what we are seeing on the back side is that the more well-documented that tree is, that family is, the fewer the changes and the fewer the problems with people messing with it, okay? So the other thing that you can do, there are a couple ways that you can get information in there that cannot be changed. One is you can put together a proof statement or a proof argument, save it as a PDF document and upload that or attach that as a PDF to that family group. No one can go in and edit or change that, family, that PDF document that you have put. So, for example, let's say that somebody keeps going back and forth and trying to attach that person to a set of parents that have been proven over and over and over again. Those aren't the parents. You can put that proof summary together and say, these are not the parents of this individual, and here's why, and see these resources, which are you know, well documented, and that's not the person. The other area that no one can change is a discussion. So you can open a new discussion and you can say um, this person was not the same as this person. Uh, this is why. And if anybody would like to discuss it with me further, you know, you can, it will connect you uh, so that you can go in. So if you want to get information into the tree that nobody can mess with, those are your two ways to do it. Up under the animal portion, they can go in and they can edit. But now think about the fact that anybody can come back in open your proof document, look up there and say, oh, so-and-so changed it on this day, and uh, go back and then do it. Now, no one's immune from those changes. Not even me, okay? My father's name was Joy, J-O-Y. He was raised in the upper country in Arizona. Uh, it was a Danish community. There are a number of men named Joy in that area. Joy Wade, Joy Ashcroft, Joy Whitey, Joy Rancher. Uh, it was a name commonly used by that community. Someone went in the other day, and because his father's name was J, J-A-Y, they assumed that they got my father's name incorrect. And so, what did they do for me? They changed my father's name to J. Now, my father had an older brother that died of scarlet fever. His name was Bernard J. And so there was already a J in the family, named after my grandfather. And so I went in and I undid it and I told them why it was really joy and not Jay. Now my dad worked for the railroad. He worked with a very rough crowd. Um, his middle name was Thomas. The guys at the railroad refused to call him Joy, so they all called him JT. So just there you have it. <laughs> Research suggestions will come in and it is this this example shows that there are no sources attached to this family. And so that's a research suggestion that will tell you, you probably should add some sources to this, to this data and strengthen the conclusion there that those people are related. This one tells you that there are data problems with the tree conclusion. This one says that they're married before age 12. The marriage year for one spouse shows the person has less than 12 years of age. Well, that's something that you should check into and validate and fix uh, in that instance. When Family Tree was first launched, um, I went into it and found my second great-grandfather, born in 1823, christened in 1536. <laughs> Note to programmers, algorithm, christening date should be later than birthday. Okay. <laughs> Um, I know that one of the things that we like is we like contrast. Sometimes you can see the difference between uh, that view and this view where we have added contrast. Some You can change your screen so that if you would prefer white writing on dark background, you can get this and it's easier on the eyes. I know that for many of us we prefer this view, so that's one of the things that's been added. So let's now talk for just a minute about those mobile apps I mentioned earlier. You can take your family history with you wherever you go. Now think about, though, our challenge. Family trees, family information tends to be this big, and these little devices are this big, okay? So am I going to tell you that it's the perfect app? No, but let's use it for what it's good at and increase our ability to share that information. 
One of the things that you can do there is to connect and share with family stories. So you get together, you're having dinner, somebody starts telling a story, guess what? You take your phone out, you can click on the app, and you can record the story. I did it the other day at the dinner table. My mother-in-law was at the table. Um, she was telling us about uh, when she was a young girl, she and her sister, her father, made them a little dollhouse. And this was just, this was a man who was an overachiever, okay? He was an electrician by trade and, and worked for the telephone company and all these kinds of things. And so this dollhouse had lighting all the way through it in every room. And, you know, I mean, it was a fabulous dollhouse. Well, I just popped on the app and I just recorded the whole little story as she told it there at the dinner table. And you know it takes that long to do it. And then I've got it preserved and I've saved it. Well, it's in her voice talking about something that you might remember at some point and share with your grandchildren, but now I can share it with my grandchildren in her voice uh, and that memory is, is captured. So as you uh, discover those, uh, you can also look at the photos that have been uploaded and you can continue to upload photos. Let's say that you are at uh, visiting a relative you can take a photo of a photo. They may not want to let it out of their possession. Uh, you can at least take a photo of it and you can preserve those. We don't have a limit on the number of photos you can add. I actually talked to our guys and said, are you sure you're not going to? No. Load as many photos as you want. So they're, they're loading them up there. Um, but you can capture those priceless family moments uh, and share those with your family. Uh, the other day, uh, we had a gathering at my home. Uh, my wife and all of her first cousins are extremely close. Um, it's, it's a great thing, but we had a, a gathering, which we do with the First Cousins from time to time, and then we all sat in a big circle, and here were the rules. They were going to go around the room, and we were going to talk about what we were doing, and the, and the rule was, you have to talk about what you're doing, not what your kids are doing, okay? We want to know what you're doing, and so every one of them went around the room. I sat there with my app, and as each one would do it, I would type in the name, I would record it, and I would capture it that moment in time of what all of them are doing and uploaded it on the mobile app. So you can see that you can do anything with it anytime uh, you're there. So save those stories for your, for your children. Uh, let them understand. My mother was a storyteller. Oh, how I wish that I had captured more of what she told. Um, my sister and I have been trying to capture what we can remember. Um, some, some of the things are just dumb. I mean, we went through the other day and we made a list of all the pets our family had ever owned and where we got them and what happened to them. It's a fun little list, but it's just one of those things that you can do and you can save those stories and those memories. So, use the audio app, use the pictures app, uh, use all of those for what they're, what they're built for and identify the people in the photos. Um, so often, you know, you get that box of pictures, nobody's identified in them, they may as well be your relatives as mine because I have a clue who they are. Uh, those moments are stored forever. So I told you about the Granite Mountain Record Ball. This is a picture of the outside of it. Um, we store long term uh, all of this information. And we've been around since 1894. I can guarantee you that we are going to continue to, to do this. This is central to what we do. Uh, and um, we're not going to be bought. We're not going to be sold. We're gonna, you know, this is uh, the business we're in. So. Like I said, share it on social media. Uh, it's a great way to share it with your grandkids and your other and your cousins and your other relatives. If you share some of these, you can um, create an experience for them in which they can begin to consume and enjoy family history in the same way that you do. But it's in it's in a format that they like, and it's in something that they will pop open, and that may lead to questions and opportunities for you to share. Information. So preserve your family stories in all of that, and we hope that you put those up and list those. You can put them also in um, family search directly. So here, for example, is a specific letter. Uh, Dear nephew, it's with pleasure I sit down to write you a few lines for the first time since we came to the new world. Um, and so here you are uh, capturing what's going on in this person's life from the very start. Uh, military service. Uh, I'm a project coordinator for the War of 1812 project. Uh, we're putting those images up of the pensioners from um, the War of 1812, putting those up for free on Fold 3. Um, those files we recently went through and we 
tried to contact the descendants of people that we could identify that had a more of a T12 pension to get them to look at the pension and then add that data to uh, the tree. Uh, so all of those events, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, uh, get them to tell you and record those stories and find the people that have served. We're losing uh, World War II veterans at the rate of a thousand per day right now, dying off. And so we need to capture what we can of that history. Stories from newspapers. Um, here's a story about uh, B.K. Curtis. He moved in 1884 from Michigan to Idaho. Um, this talks about uh, a half a ton of honey that he had produced and said he was going to bring it in, in about two weeks, he was going to bring a ton of honey uh, within that time because he'd been able to sell it so quickly. Other historical societies um, outside of Family Search can create their own page on the research wiki and you can then link the files or you can link that information so look for entities that may be there as well and links to those genealogies so in this instance this these are the biographical files it's a deceased biographical file in the St. Michael Historical Society you can see there when it links to uh, the person in the family tree and you follow that link and it takes you directly into those details about that person. So, Family Search continues to actively gather, preserve, and share numerous record collections, both online and on microfilm. Um, we have what are called affiliate libraries. The Historical Society of Pennsylvania is an affiliate library. And so you can order um, many of the films. If it's not been posted online, you can order those. Uh, patrons can access Family Search uh, services and resources free online, of course. Like I said, free is a compelling offering. Um, you all get a free membership to Family Search today, just so you know. <laughs> we will continue to work with our partners. We will continue to look for ways that we can share information and do different things and do good things. Uh, we are partnering with the Museum of the American Revolution here in Philadelphia. We are creating uh, an integrated discovery experience that helps visitors experience part of their family history as they go through the exhibit. You'll, when that exhibit opens, you'll see our logo there in places. We are helping with data behind the scenes to help create that experience as you go through the museum. Uh, the Family Search Catalog now expand, expands to the view of other archives and other resources throughout the world. So we are interested in gathering uh, data, but we are also interested in simply pointing you to the data that you can use. So, uh, the Family Search Wiki can, collects the knowledge of experts from numerous disciplines. So, I hope that you will share what you know in the wiki, and I hope that you will continually go into the wiki to try and learn more information about the area of geographic research that you want to do and be able to learn uh, what the resources are there. The Family Tree will continue to improve. Uh, some people ask me, will we, will we put DNA uh, into the family tree? Uh, the short answer is no. So think about it for a moment. Remember that we are in a Wikipedia model. If you go in and you change the identifier of that individual, you could end up with a DNA strain that now no longer reflects the identity of the individual that's there. Okay, That's the simple answer. Because um, we are going to rely on our partners to maintain those DNA databases. We believe in DNA, we believe it's a very effective tool in researching family history, but um, I often get asked the question, will it be in the family tree? And it will not for that specific reason, because we don't want to suddenly mislead somebody by saying this DNA strain belongs to this individual and not accurately reflect that that's the person. Family search mobile apps uh, make it easy to share. We're getting better with those. Uh, some of this work was launched very quickly. We're going back, we're changing some of the things that are under the search engine and some of the things that are fixing that, and we will continue to do that. We will continue to build resources in individuals doing, for individuals doing family history for a long, long time. I can promise you that. Thank you very much. <laughs>